Yep, so it's a recording. Well, let's switch to the live screen then, and I'll wait another three minutes before I begin. Yep. It's 7.01, so. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this uh, monthly program of the Audubon Chapter of Minneapolis. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you. My name is Keith Olstead, and I chair the board for our Audubon Chapter. Um, I hope that you're paying attention to our weekly email um, blasts uh, to our membership. Lots of information there about uh, what our chapter is up to, uh, what's um, what some possible action steps for you can be, um, and uh, what our upcoming meetings are and what they will involve and how you can participate in them. Um, I do want to note that um, this is a particularly um, significant week for our chapter. Uh, tomorrow, um, our chapter, uh, along with uh, Smart Growth Minneapolis, um, goes before the Minnesota Supreme Court to argue our case against the city of Minneapolis for the city's passage of the uh, Minneapolis 2040 plan without having done adequate assessment of its environmental impact. Um, I, I'm hoping that each of us can send some positive energy to our attorneys as they make their case before the Minnesota Supreme Court. I'd also want to notice and to note that um, this is also the week in which uh, many of us are involved in the Global Bird Rescue, um, which is organized by FLAP out of Toronto, Canada. Uh, where we are monitoring um, the bird deaths um, from birds colliding with some of the big buildings in our city. Um, my wife and I found four dead birds um, around the Minneapolis Art Institute, uh, a fine institution which we support strongly, um, but is a death trap for migratory birds. So um, every day um, our members are checking buildings, sending pictures, um, I hope uh, you can uh, pay attention to the reports that come from that as well. And then finally, I want to make sure that you know about our little campaign. Um, I vote for birds uh, from the Minneapolis chapter. We don't endorse candidates. We don't endorse parties. Uh, but we do say that when we vote, we want to have what's best for birds and therefore for all of us at the top of our minds and by wearing these buttons, we suspect that people will ask us about that and we can talk about what our environmental priorities are. So um, if you're interested in getting one of our buttons, again, check our weekly email blasts. Um, you can either pick some buttons up or we can mail them to you for a modest fee and, um, and we'd be delighted to have your support in this little campaign. Uh, we are also in the midst or on the, on the back edge of the fall migration. So I'm wondering what kinds of uh, luck people are having in, in finding birds these days. Um, I yesterday morning had the good fortune of watching an orange crowned warbler uh, bathe in a little mud bath um, down at the bass ponds. And as it bathed, it actually revealed its orange crown. I could see the whole orange crown of the orange crowned warbler, and almost no one ever sees that. That was really fun. Um, so I'm curious, what kinds of experiences are you having these days as you look for birds? Please just use the, um, the, the uh, raise your hand or, uh, and we'll unmute you so you can give a report to the rest of us. Um, or if you want, you can enter a, a, an observation in the Q&A section and, um, and we'll uh, connect with you that way. So what are you seeing? What are you finding? What can you share with us about your experience in this fall migration? We'll wait here for a minute or two while you figure out the technology and can give us your updates. This week, we have unseasonably gorgeous weather for getting outside. So I, I hope you're getting out there and, and finding some birds. 
Yeah. We actually have somebody, um, uh, Gustavo, uh, do you see the notes in the Q&A? Um, he says, I'm in Northern Illinois, I had a lifer Leconte Sparrow this Sunday. Very good. Yeah, the Leconte Sparrow's nest just, uh, their, their lower range is um, sort of north of the St. Cloud, um, Anoka area, and um, they'll definitely, beautiful bird, beautiful bird, great find. Anyone else? Tell us what you're seeing. The technology may, um, may make our reporting a little harder than we want it to be, but Oh, here's from Ann Hanley. Uh, she has Nashville warblers in her yard. Um, uh, Roger Everhart um, has been banding most mornings, and it's definitely sparrow season. Fox sparrows have arrived in Minnesota, and he also had his first golden crown kinglet today. Anyone else? This is great. The birds are there to be seen. It sometimes takes more patience in the fall than it does in the spring, but you know, that's a good lesson to learn. Well, uh, as we move ahead here, feel free to post more sightings in either the um, chat or um, in the Q&A um, function on your screen. And we'll look forward to learning more about what people are seeing. I'd like to move ahead with the program. Um, this is a, a particularly exciting program. This is our first genuinely international program in quite some time. Um, and so we'll call on our board member, Wilmer Fernandez, to um, introduce Dr. Komar and the program. Wilmer, take it away, please. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Uh, uh, this is, uh, like Keith said, uh, very exciting program. Uh, my name is Wilmer Fernandez, and even though I've been I've been here in the Minnesota, in the Hennepin County in Minnesota for almost 20 years, I, I grew up in Honduras, and I still have family there. And I still travel back to Honduras, so it's a great, uh, a great, great meeting here uh, that we you know covering this topic of how are we uh, you know, connected to, to this region uh, and the work that people are doing in, in Honduras. Uh, to remind you, we will have plenty of, time of, uh, plenty of time for questions, but you can always type your question. There is a chat window or there is a Q&A area where you can type your questions. Uh, and we will be uh, you know, addressing, addressing those at the end of, of, of the presentation. So um, Dr. Oliver Comar is, is professor of ecology at, uh, in natural resource management at Samorano University. Samorano University uh, is, an is, a, is a university focused on agriculture uh, in Honduras. Uh, Dr. Comar is a lifelong birder and uh, with degrees from Ohio uh, Wesleyan University and the University of Kansas. Uh, if you have bird in the uh, Central American area, especially in Northern Central America, he's, an, he's the author of a Peterson Field Guide, the Peterson Field Guide to the Birds of Northern Central America. Uh, so he, has, uh, he was born in Massachusetts, uh, but he's been living in Honduras for uh, over 10 years, I believe. Um, so uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Komar. And uh, so Oliver, you're, uh, you can start sharing your presentation. The floor is, is yours. Well, thank you very, very much, Wilmer and Keith. And uh, saludos to everybody who's participating in today's meeting. Let me get my screen shared. Let's see. Uh, Wilmer, can you just confirm that you can see the, the opening slide? Yes. Okay, wonderful. 
So once again, thanks very much for the invitation to talk to the chapter. And today uh, I'm going to speak about strategies for bird conservation and research in Honduras. And um, as Wilmer uh, mentioned, I'm the president of the Honduran Ornithological Association and a professor of ecology at Zamorano University. So I'm going to talk to you a lot about the strategies that that the ASHO, the Honduran Ornithological Association, is implementing to promote bird conservation and research in Honduras. Let's uh, move from, let's see if this is, let's move from Minneapolis down to Honduras in Central mm -hmm. America, in the northern part of Central America, next to the countries of Nicaragua, El Salvador, and Guatemala. And this is precisely where most of the migratory birds are going right now. In fact, we've been seeing migratory birds down here since uh, mid-August. The very first migratory birds arrived to Honduras in late July. Birds like Louisiana water thrush and orchard oriole are arriving in late July. And uh, in by the end of September, we have large groups of broad-winged hawks. Uh, yellow warblers are all on territory already. So a lot of birds are leaving North America during the, the height of the summer heat. The yellow warblers and black and white warblers, um, tanagers are, are showing up, summer tanagers and scarlet tanagers. Baltimore Orioles have showed up already. Um, but we're going to get back into the, the talk. So I'm going to talk to you about uh, a little bit about what is the Honduran Ornithological Association, how it functions, who we are, when we, since when we've existed. Uh, mention our strategic objectives and our flagship projects. I'll talk about our key conservation strategies and research strategies, which are going to focus a lot on citizen science like eBird and iNaturalist. And I'll finish the talk with um, mentioning a partnership that we've established now with the Audubon chapter of Minneapolis uh, for bird monitoring. The Honduran Ornithological Association is a nonprofit organization uh, managed by volunteers. We don't have any paid staff. It was founded about 10 years ago, exactly 10 years ago, July 2010, by 31 um, people who were a mix of biologists and uh, birding tour guides or bird enthusiasts of one sort or another. We have a board of directors that's elected every two years. So I was elected in March, uh, although I've been on as the president, I've been on the board for um, six years. The board is elected by our dues paying members, which are both individuals and institutions at our annual meetings. So we're I imagine we're very much similar to the, the Audubon Society or the, the chapters of the Audubon Society. Our membership is growing uh, every year. Almost every year we've grown, or at least there's a, a tendency to grow over the years, the last six years. So we have about 135, 136 members at the moment, including 116 individuals and 20 organizations or businesses or institutions. This is our board of directors, the 10 of us. Uh, I wanted to share this picture mainly just so you could see how diverse we are as a board. And it's something I'm very happy about. Very pleased that we have a, a diverse board of directors with a mix of, um, I mean, not only do we have men and women and older people and young people, but we also have um, a mix of biologists and uh, birding, uh, birding professionals like bird tour leaders. Uh, and there's also people who manage private reserves and are involved in protected areas management in general. So I'm very happy about our diversity. And mention, I want to mention that the organization is not just the board of directors either. I mean, in addition to the 10 board, board members who are all very active as volunteers in the organization, we also have 26 members who are active in seven permanent working committees. We have 26 members who are coordinators of their local bird clubs, and we have 13 bird clubs that form a type of federation. They're all associated with, with our organization. There are 135 dues paying members, but there are um, another group of people who don't pay dues but participate in the bird club activities, about 200 people. And then if you go online, you'll discover a much larger 
world of people who kind of participate online or follow uh, ASHO. So I mentioned there on the, on the screen that we have over 5,000 followers to our Facebook page. And of course we have a web page and we are, have, have um, accounts on some of the other social media, Instagram and Twitter, in case any of you are connected that way and wanna follow what we're doing. I mentioned the 13 bird clubs. They're distributed throughout Honduras, mostly in the cities, but in some of the much smaller um, regional urban centers. Uh, we don't have bird clubs in every part of Honduras yet, but almost every year, some people get organized and, and asked to join with the new bird club. So we probably will soon have bird clubs even in Eastern Honduras, where right now we don't have any. But this is something else I'm really pleased about because um, when I joined the ASHO about, I think it was eight, well, seven years ago, there were no bird clubs, or at least none that I was aware of. And I thought the ASHO might be a bird club. <laughs> but uh, very soon people started to form bird clubs and um, we created kind of a, a more formal way that the bird clubs could be managed and the ASHO prom promotes and supports the bird clubs with um, kind of governance assistance, you know, helping them with things like planning their, their activities every year. And we put together a monthly calendar with all their activities so everybody can share their activities to a broader public. Um, we encourage them to do things like create, so use social media. And the, almost all of the clubs have a Facebook page or a Facebook group. So this is a great way, uh, there's a lot of young people involved in these clubs. Um, it's a great way for us to kind of spread the bird conservation message and also to help build new birding, uh, bird tourism professionals in the country. So the ASHO was created for four strategic objectives. And here they are, A, B, C, and D, species conservation, promoting, uh, avi tourism or the birding industry, promoting scientific research and promoting environmental education. And by the way, we have one species of bird that exists in Honduras and nowhere else in the world. It's the Honduran emerald. There it is on the screen in case you want to come down and look for a life bird in Honduras. This will surely be one of them unless you've been here before. So I'm going to go into a little bit about what our um, flagship projects are in each one of these strategic objectives. So for species conservation, we do a lot of promoting species conservation through, through social media, through messages and messaging on social media. Things like encouraging people not to contribute to the reduction of wild bird populations through the pet trade. Uh, please don't buy birds that are being sold out on the street or in, even in pet stores. Uh, the scarlet macaw is a very popular pet, of course, and it's often found in in restaurants and hotels and it creates a lot of pressure for the wild population of scarlet macaws in Honduras and by the way scarlet macaw is the national bird of Honduras so there's a lot of national pride with the scarlet macaw but we encourage um, people to, to not contribute to this this problem through social media um, we try to put all kinds of messaging up through our social media and the nice thing is that a lot of it gets picked up by other larger social media or by the news media. Uh, things like during the breeding season, please don't pick juvenile birds up and take them home with you because their parents are you know, waiting for a chance to come down and feed them. Um, helping people not kind of change their behavior in a way that is better for, for birds. But in terms of a flagship project, our flagship project, which we actually collect, uh, we, we promote, uh, we look for donors, we try to collect funds to support activities that specifically support the environmental law enforcement agencies in Honduras, which are underfunded. So things like the Honduras Wildlife Department is often um, receiving uh, birds that have been seized from traffickers and they need to get the birds to a wildlife um, a wildlife uh, operation that ha has that cares for for injured birds, for example, but sometimes they don't have the means to transport the birds. So 
we offer services and support to, to the wildlife department and the environmental justice agency of the government to help them with uh, any, any aspect of, of enforcing environmental laws. If they need help with transportation or they need um, technical information, we have a group of volunteers who, who, are, who are ready to support those, those um, initiatives. And in terms of our second strategic objective, the promoting bird watching, uh, this is, we see this as very important. It's related to species conservation because uh, bird watching is good for the economy. And as bird watchers distribute out among the countryside and visit either private reserves or, or public reserves, protected areas, local communities who are often um, interested in that land or, or, or perhaps in, in benefiting in some way from the land, if they see people visiting the, uh, these areas, the protected areas or even private reserves for tourism, it helps them appreciate that there's value to that land. That instead of seeing it as wasted land that should be cut down and turned into a cornfield, they see that somebody is benefiting from preserving the forest. And that's very important in terms of a general conservation message. So we see promoting bird tourism as a, a way to improve the, the local economy, uh, but also to increase the perceived value of natural resources like forests and just birds themselves. Um, well, there's another reason to promote the birding industry and it's also related to conservation. If we want people to change their behavior in a way that protects birds, uh, perhaps by uh, buy less materials or do something that they know is going to preserve forests, we need people to appreciate natural ecosystems and appreciate birds. And people who live in cities often don't appreciate natural ecosystems or, or wildlife. So by encouraging people to get out and look at the wildlife and to begin to identify birds or to appreciate the wildlife in one way or another, it's creating a much larger kind of a pool of people who are willing to do something to protect wildlife. I'm going to talk more about that in a little bit when I talk about our, our overall strategy. Um, okay, let me just go back to previous, whoops. I didn't mention this yet, but one of the ways that we promote um, birding industry is by supporting our bird clubs for them to do more travel, to get out and on field trips, uh, or to be able to enjoy birding during their trips. So a lot of the members of the clubs don't have binoculars uh, or don't have field guides, and we uh, actively distribute materials that we get from donations, such as field guides to the birds or some binoculars and telescopes. We have purchased telescopes and lent them to our clubs. Uh, so that the clubs have a more kind of rewarding experience when they do go on a bird trip. And um, we also use our social networks program to circulate messages about the importance of uh, biodiversity and, and the, the connection between biodiversity and tourism and the importance of um, avi tourism and ecotourism in general. Um, to the local economies. And then I mentioned also that we help the clubs produce monthly activities calendars. Here's our calendar from September. Even though we're in a pandemic right now and we're not encouraging people to go on organized birding trips, uh, all of our clubs have gotten involved in some sort of uh, virtual meetings and having meetings on Zoom or some other way, just like we're doing right now. And we share some of the organized events on our calendar, which is published. Uh, it's distributed through our networks and it's published on our, on our website. And then we have another calendar that's also a project of ours. It's, a, it's actually a wall calendar with beautiful photographs of birds, a photograph for each month. Uh, the photographs are, are contributed by our members. We have a lot of photographers in the group who take really wonderful photographs. And then this calendar, um, the annual calendar, we look for sponsorship often from, often from the government tourism industry. Um, 
or tourism agency, I should say. And then the, the bird tour operators in Honduras use, uh, they get copies of the calendar and they take them to their international fairs where they promote bird tourism, international bird tourism in Honduras. So the calendar is bilingual. Okay, um, we do have a, a flagship project also for promoting the birding industry that we're raising money for, which is exploration of new areas in Honduras, learning more about birds in areas that have never been visited or have been visited very, very little. Um, so we call it searching for birds in underexplored areas of Honduras. And uh, that's something that we hope will also promote new areas for, for, for birding and will also help train the bird tour guides to learn to know more about the birds in Honduras. So when we, when we have the expeditions like this organized, we want to see uh, bird tour guides or potential tour guides in the, coming from our bird clubs joining these expeditions. Our next objective is scientific research. Um, unfortunately, there's not a whole lot of ornithologists, professional ornithologists in Honduras, although there are a few. And we have quite a few biologists in our uh, association. Uh, almost virtually all of the, the ones who work with birds are members. And we also have a scientific um, committee with eight members, all of whom, if I, well, seven of the eight are professional biologists and do research projects with birds. So we have a, um, one of the things that we do is we contribute to the vetting of data that's collected by our bird clubs and by other people who visit Honduras on science, uh, citizen science platforms like eBird and iNaturalist. So all of the, um, the eBird reviewers, for example, are on our science committee. Uh, let, I'll talk a little bit more about citizen science because this is part of our research strategy to promote citizen science, uh, partly because it's a way to collect a lot of data without spending a lot of money. But we also encourage all of our members, well, we encourage all of our members to to contribute to the citizen science platforms when they go bird watching. So if every time there's a, a club bird watching trip, they do an eBird list. Uh, the clubs themselves have eBird accounts and many of the members of the clubs have eBird accounts and they're all encouraged to, to contribute to the, the databases in eBird and, and in iNaturalist uh, when, when they're photographers. They're encouraged to also contribute their photographs to iNaturalist. We frequently have lectures about how to use eBird and how to use iNaturalist and often give recognition to people who are doing outstanding work with these platforms. One of the great things about the platforms is it helps monitor uh, populations, or at least it collects data that can be used for monitoring populations, and it creates all kinds of um, visible graphs that are available on the internet for, internet for anybody interested in the birds of Honduras. But we also encourage our members to participate in um, region-wide bird monitoring efforts like the Central American Waterbirds uh, count and the Central American Shorebirds count, counts that are promoted um, across Central America and even Latin America. We sometimes get some small donations to help cover costs for the clubs to organize field trips that specifically support monitoring efforts. Uh, there's a photograph in the corner of a snail kite one of our clubs does snail kite counts at an important snail kite uh, breeding area that's in central Honduras at Lake Yohoa, where there's a population of hundreds and hundreds of snail kites. I think their highest count was over 600 birds. So it's a pretty important snail kite um, population. But it varies a lot, and so we have monitoring of the snail kite population. And our flagship project for supporting scientific research is to support ornithology students or biologists in Honduras who are studying birds. Uh, perhaps they need a grant or a small grant for field research or they want to participate in a, in a congress or travel for some reason to participate in a course. Um, we're raising money to contribute to, to those kinds of efforts and uh, that's our flagship project for promoting scientific research. Of course our individual biologists uh, that are part of the association often work in institutions like the National University or Zamorano University where I work and some of us uh, look for funding for scientific research through our, our institutions. Yeah. 
The fourth strategic objective is environmental education. And um, we have a very active social um, networks committee. I'm very proud of our social networks committee and all the work they do. Um, we do a lot of publications, uh, probably on average two publications a month. We've published things like the common birds of Tegucigalpa and the common birds of the Valle de Sula, the Sula Valley, and several other uh, urban centers with the idea that we perhaps have materials that would get used in local schools and encourage more people to, to learn about the birds in their, around their homes and in their yards and their gardens. Uh, we also have a blog that publishes more scientific notes that we call El Esmeralda, which refers to the, the hummingbird, the endemic hummingbird of Honduras. The blog used to be a little magazine that we actually printed, but these days we publish it just online. Uh, so we do a lot of publications that contribute to environmental education. Um, and our flagship project for environmental education, the one that we raise money for, is funding workshops and uh, birding camps for kids. We've done a couple of birding camps for kids over the, over the last few years. We'd like to do more. And uh, we either the, the main ASHO board or the clubs are involved in some sort of educational workshops several times a year. And it's an area that we see as very important to, to build more birders. In fact, quite a few of the graduates of these workshops have become active birders and active members of the ASHO and active contributors to the citizen science platforms. And so we see that as a really valuable way to, to further the conservation message and the research message. Okay, a little bit more generally about our conservation strategy. I'm going to mention the conservation strategy and the research strategy for the ASHO. For the conservation strategy, we recognize that, well, first let me say that, you know, one of the principal ways that people do conservation is through protected areas management and private reserves. Well, we don't own any land, so we're not directly involved in um, conservation land management. Perhaps in the future, it's something that we could explore. And of course, it costs a lot of money to do that. Um, but we recognize the, the importance of getting a much broader portion of the public involved in being able to recognize birds. Because you need to rec if you want to care about birds, you need to recognize them first. It's really hard to conserve a resource that you don't even recognize. And if you, people who care about things, care about things they know, they've come to know. So Honduras is a country of 10 million people, but barely 5,000 people have shown any interest in birds. Those are the people who follow the ASHO in our, in our um, social media. At least we, we don't think there's many more than 5,000 people who have shown an active interest in birds who are resident in Honduras. And yet um, we need to make, if we want to have a major shift in the kind of the general conservation uh, ethic of the Honduran public, having 0.05% of the public show an interest in birds just isn't good enough. So imagine 20 times that number of people, 1% of the population. If we get 1% of the population to know and appreciate birds, would that make a difference? And that means 100,000 Honduran residents getting involved in appreciating nature. So I think that would make a real big difference. Now, maybe it's not even enough. Maybe we need 500,000 or even a million people. But we don't need everybody. We don't have to have 10 million people become bird enthusiasts. Uh, with a large, much larger number, maybe 100,000, it could make a real difference in the, the general behavior of people in this country. You know, less trash being thrown away, less businesses uh, polluting streams, uh, more farms putting aside natural forests to, for conservation, more organic farming, etc. So that's really our strategy right now in the ASHO is the social messaging using social networks, publications, um, lectures on the internet, articles in the newspaper to try to change more people into 
being interested in birds, knowing something about the birds, and then appreciating them. And for example, during the pandemic, we've actually been quite successful during the last six or eight months uh, when a lot of the bird watching activities are actually closed down because people don't want to leave home or can't leave home. You know, we're on quarantine in most of the country. Um, but we've discovered that there's a lot we can do with the social networks, with, with webinars, for example, on Zoom and Facebook Live. So we've had a, a, a lecture series that's been very successful over the last four months, three months, I guess. Uh, we've had, I, by my count, 22 keynote lectures on Facebook Live with about 40,000 views. So that's a start. And uh, of course, those are lectures that are sitting there available for people to rewatch anytime they want. Some of them are going to get stored on YouTube for, for long term as well. And we've been promoting birding from home events uh, and using the, the national media, the radio and television. Uh, we haven't had to pay for advertising. We've just, you know, offered to do interviews on, on these networks. And a pretty large number of people have seen the, the promotions that we're doing. So we're doing things like uh, promoting some bio blitzes on iNaturalist, uh, eBird events like Global Big Day and October Big Day coming up and um, the World Birding Weekend coming up this month. Um, we have, right now we're, we organized a countrywide hawk migration count that you can do from home. So we're just encouraging people to do hawk migration counts and share their counts on eBird to a, to a particular group account that we can then report back on. Uh, we've created those guides to the common birds of major cities where every week we publish ID identification tips uh, for relatively common birds through, through the social networks like Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And in terms of the research strategies, as I mentioned earlier, we're promoting citizen science in every opportunity that we can. Uh, for example, here we're looking at the, uh, the bird page for Honduras on iNaturalist. I'm not sure how many of you use iNaturalist. Hopefully you're all using it. But basically for bird photographers who don't know what species they're photographing or aren't interested in doing a bird, a complete bird list like we do on eBird, uh, this is the perfect place for them to report their sightings. They can learn how to identify the birds by uploading a photograph, even if they don't know what's on the photograph, because iNaturalist will give them suggestions, and they can start that whole process of learning how to identify a bird. And if they make a mistake, other people, including many of the ASHA members, who are kind of reviewing what's being published on iNaturalist about birds, will, will put in comments or suggest what species they're actually uh, photographing. So this is another phenomenon that we've seen. We've seen bird photographers who knew absolutely nothing about birds start to learn about birds by identifying the birds on the photographs. And now some of them have become the top contributors to eBird and to documenting rare birds in new corners of, of Honduras. It's just spectacular to see this process of you learn a little bit about something and then you become a great contributor. Uh, here we can see that there's 570 people who have reported birds on iNaturalist for Honduras. Um, they've reported 625 species. There's about 760 species reported on eBird. So not all the species have been photographed on iNaturalist. 15,000 observations so far. And I bet within a year it's going to be double that. Here's another uh, output of data from iNaturalist showing all this, the locations where people have reported birds in Honduras all those red quadrants on the map. And then if we, we can talk about eBird also. eBird, of course, was designed for bird watchers. I imagine many of you are using eBird. Um, here's an output from the, the eBird page for Honduras. Of course, every country and every department has, or every state and uh, county in the United States has their own page in Honduras. And you can do things like see uh, the most recent sightings of each species or or the first sighting of each species or the highest counts of each species. Here we're looking at the highest counts of each species. And up at the top row, we can see that there's 83,000 complete checklists that have been shared to eBird database for Honduras up till now. From 2,425 eBirders, of course, probably only 5% of them are ASHO members. Many of those eBirders are tourists who have come to visit Honduras and have done a few checklists. And then over on the right, it says there are 591 hotspots. 
So there's almost 600 kind of birding locations in Honduras that have been created that generate pages like this for each hotspot. And they generate illustrated checklists for each of these hotspots as well. Um, this is the map of diversity of birds where you can go on eBird and click on a, a quadrant and see which hotspots are present in that quadrant and then go directly to the hotspot and learn much more about it. So here we can see where the most number of species are, like the red quadrants are the quadrants with over 400 species reported. So Lake Yohoa and then up near uh, La Ceiba. And then this is an example of the output from the illustrated checklists on eBird that join all of our data together, uh, all the eBird uh, contributors from the ASHO and from the eco tourists who come to the country. Every time they report a bird on eBird, it's contributing to the, these wonderful data out, uh, output sources like the illustrated checklist. So here we're looking at the illustrated checklist for the department in central Honduras around Tegucigalpa. Um, and we can see the patterns in the bar charts of the migratory birds, like the first one, the Western Kingbird, which is, should be showing up just now in October and will be real common in Honduras until April and then will start declining and disappear by mid-May. The next bird, Eastern Kingbird, is not a winter visitor in Honduras. And of course, we can all know that just by looking at the bar chart. And we can see that it's a transient, um, just uh, what we call a, a passage migrant. It's only present in September and October, and then they're all gone. They have all gone to South America, and it comes back on its way north in the end of March and into May. Scissor-tailed flycatcher would be another winter visitor. And then the fourth bird, the fork-tailed flycatcher, which many people would think is a resident in Honduras. In our department, in this department, Francisco Morazan, turns out it looks to be just a summer visitor. So by contributing our, our observations to eBird, we start to learn about patterns that aren't even in the books. You know, migratory patterns of species in certain regions that you can't find anywhere in the books, such as forktail flycatcher being a summer visitor to central Honduras. And of course, we can look at the warblers. Here is the part of the bar chart that has the Townsend's warbler from Western North America. These are all migratory and they just winter visitors. Hermit warbler from the Northwest. Golden-cheeked warbler from the state of Texas. And black-throated green warbler, which I imagine is probably a breeding resident in Minnesota and parts nearby. Uh, winter visitors. And something else I'd like to point out, although I'm sure you all already know this, but the winter visitors in Honduras spend more time in Honduras than they do in the breeding range. So look at the black-throated green warbler at the bottom or, or any of the warblers on this page, and we can see that they're, they're here in every month except for three. So for nine months of the year, we have them in Honduras, and for just three months of the year, they're gone. So they, they, they fly up north, breed as fast as they can, and get back here as fast as they can as well. They don't even know what would happen to them if they didn't migrate because they migrate during the heat of the summertime, right? Just the ones you see in late October and November are the stragglers, some of the juveniles that didn't figure out what they were supposed to do. But most of the warblers have all left by mid-September and you don't even see them. They, they fly very high, they don't stop anywhere. Um, it's mostly the juveniles, a few of the juveniles that didn't quite get the message about what they were supposed to do that you see trickling through the migratory stopover sp spots in, in North America. Okay, uh, another thing, another great thing about eBird and iNaturalist is all the rich media that gets uploaded, uh, the photographs, the audio, and the video. These are fantastic resources that by hundreds of people pooling these resources, it creates all kinds of opportunities, including research opportunities. Here we're looking at the top rated photographs uploaded to eBird just this year from Honduras. And it's, you know, if you were gonna come visit Honduras, this would be a nice place to go and just check out what birds are here to get a look at them. But we can look at the statistics in the top left and see that over 15,000 photographs of birds have been uploaded to eBird just this year, which if you remember was about the total number of bird reports in iNaturalist for all years combined. So there's still more data going into eBird than there is into iNaturalist, even if you just look at the photographs. 
And there's uh, almost 800 audio recordings have been uploaded just this year and over 100 videos just this year. And here I'm going to share with you uh, some of the way that eBird data gets used. If you're on eBird in any one of the portals, you can go to their science menu. I happen to be here in a New York Breeding Bird Atlas portal, but we're just, if you go to the science menu, you go to eBird status and trends. I'm going to click on uh, status and trends. I just want to show you some of the great uh, eBird products that we're contributing to, that everybody's contributing to every time we report birds in eBird. So we're going to look at the animated maps. Uh, this is an abundance animation for the black-bellied whistling duck. Um, there's now over 600 of these animations available from Cornell Lab of Ornithology through eBird. Uh, it's a great thing to explore and to see how the populations move around from one month to another. Again, uh, you can learn about population movements that aren't in the books anywhere, that no one even were, was aware of what was going on. Now we're going to look at scissor tail flycatchers, which breed in mostly in Texas, but also Oklahoma and Kansas. It looks like maybe in Missouri as well. And they're very abundant, of course, in the summertime, but by December, they've almost all disappeared from North America, some left over in Florida. Look at that again. So here they are in the breeding season, scissor tail flycatchers. And then they all, in October, November, they all channel down or funnel down into the Pacific coast mostly of Central America. So here in Honduras, if we go down to the Pacific coast, we can see huge flocks of scissor tail flycatchers flying into their nighttime roosts. Literally thousands of scissor tail flycatchers that get together every night and roost and they're easy to find in the daytime as well. Now let's look at an animation for broad-winged hawk, um, one that's migrating right now. I've been seeing them migrating over my house for the last couple of weeks. Um, I imagine you can still see a few in North America as well. But again, it's probably just the stragglers that are still hanging around. So this is wintertime. Now they go back up into North America. They're breeding in a large part of North America in the summertime. And now here we are in September, October, November, and they're all down in Central America and South America in the Andes Mountains of South America. In April, they're all going back up into streaming back up into North America. So these wonderful animated abundance uh, maps something that you can't find anywhere else really. Um, and we're all contributing to that every time we make a complete checklist on eBird. Well, we're gonna kind of wrap up this presentation with kind of an announcement of a, a collaboration between the Audubon chapter of Minneapolis and the ASHO, the Honduran Ornithological Association and the Institute for Bird Populations and the Centro Zamorano de Biodiversidad, or the Zamorano Biodiversity Center. We are going to be starting um, uh, monitoring of overwinter survivorship for North American birds and also for some of the local birds at the Uyuca Biological Reserve just outside of Tegucigalpa, which is part of the Zamorano, extended Zamorano University campus. And it's an area where um, there were several years of intensive bird monitoring carried out uh, almost 10 years ago. So we're going to go back and hopefully do at least a few years of overwinter survivorship monitoring again, and especially look for differences between these next few years and what was going on 10 years ago. Using mist nets and captures banding. Uh, this is a Swainson's thrush, one of the migratory birds that we're likely to catch. And there'll be some warblers too, Wilson's warblers and black and white warblers in several other species, and then a lot of the local hummingbirds as well. That's the end of my formal presentation. There are so, there's so much more that one could show about Honduras, including videos and photographs. Um, all of that is available, of course, on eBird and iNaturalist. Uh, but if anybody wants to ask any questions, um, how they can participate, if there are ways that anybody can participate, we, you can follow us on, on, our, on our social media. We'd love to have more followers on the social media to, for people to know what we're doing in Honduras. Honduras, of course, is a really important wintering area for wood thrushes and many other uh, the birds from North America. Uh, so if you're interested in where the birds go, follow us. And of course, you're welcome to join us as members or as, or as donors to any of our flagship projects.
Well, thanks again. And I'll stop talking and let Wilmer or Irene or Keith take over. Irene, perdón. No, th thank you very much, uh, Oliver, uh, for that uh, great overview of what the Asociación Hondureña de Ornitología, uh, uh, you know, the association is doing the work that, that you and all the members and all the birders are doing there. And I think this is important because, you know, it's, it's, it's we, we don't hear much here about, uh, you know, the work that people are doing in, in the neotropics, um, you know, uh, unfortunately, you know, most of the bad news are the ones that are highlighted, you know, about uh, countries like Honduras. So I thought it was important for the, um, for our members to just hear the, you know, the depth of the work that has been done there in terms of education, in terms of research. Uh, and also, uh, you know, like you mentioned, the, uh, the you know, the, the partnership that, you know, that we here at the chapter, we're calling the Migration Partners uh, Program, which is, uh, you know, the, the, the partnership so, so that the, uh, the overwinter monitoring station can, can, you know, the work can start there in the, in the uh, Uyuka Biological Reserve. So I think that's, uh, it's very exciting for, for our members here. Uh, I, you know, we have created, uh, let me just for the chair here, the, uh, our, in our website, we have, um, you know, we have created a, a web page. Uh, let me see if I can try to share the. Hey, Wilmer, while, while you are putting um, the website up, so there is a question, a couple of questions actually for you, Oliver, in the, in the chat. And I just wanted to add how amazing your presentation was and how impressed I am by all the work you guys do in Honduras. Um, so I, I wanted to read this question to you, Wilmer, while you, you look it up. Um, so there is a question that says, are there ways that birders visiting Honduras can help conservation in Honduras or ASO uh, projects besides just monetarily by spending money and donating money? So um, I don't know if you want to answer that question and then we can um, go to Wilmer again. Uh, that's an interesting question. We haven't really had that opportunity, but uh, I mean, one thing I would say that would, would help uh, the Honduran economy is to use local guides. Um, there are local guides in almost all of the chapters, and there are professional bird tour operators who are members of the ASHO and uh, offer really excellent guiding. So instead of like looking for an international company that's coming to Honduras, you can contact some of our, our institutional members. Um, in fact, you can find out information about them through our website, and they, they provide excellent services. And the more kind of support that goes to local companies, of course, is great for Honduras. But in terms of other kinds of volunteer opportunities, um, I, nothing really comes to mind at the moment, but I'd say uh, if you want to contact me directly uh, or stay in touch or follow the ASHO, maybe some opportunities will come up. I mean, it's just something that we haven't had much of an opportunity wow. to develop. But if, if someone is going to come down and visit Honduras and wants to explore those opportunities, be, I'll be happy to talk to them about possible opportunities. Yep. Yeah, I think that's, that's, that's important. I mean, uh, yeah, this, I just wanted to show you, know, show the, uh, the, in our webpage, we have the, uh, you know, the Migration Partners webpage, and we kind of uh, give an overview here, and, and people can, you know, one way to support their effort is, you know, we have a link here that you can donate specifically to this, uh, to this effort in our page. Uh, that's the Migration Partners, the focus on that specific project uh, of the overwinter survival station. Uh, yeah, I mean, we have, um, you know, with, in Honduras, like, Oliver said, there is, you know, uh, the, the, the birding clubs, you know, the, uh, you know, that's one thing I've noticed, you know, in the last, 
the last few years how how much the uh, participation has grown on the building club so i think the actual is doing a great work there um, promoting you know the the uh, the activities that the building clubs uh, do in in the country so oliver can you comment a little bit about you know how right now the situation are people you know getting out in smaller groups or how i mean how the whole COVID, um you know uh, quarantine has yeah. has affected? well technically it's it's um considered kind of acceptable now for small groups of up to six people to go on field trips uh, for a long time that was considered against the rules or against the law i suppose the the curfew mm -hmm. the curfew and then people would maybe go off alone um, and but yeah there, there are small groups who are getting together and going out um okay i think some of the clubs are even organizing some small small groups for field trips and there are uh, professional tour operators now who are taking clients as well on uh, small groups. Okay, so, so people are starting to do uh, tourism, uh, avi tourism? Yeah, yeah. And, and not all of the, the hotels are open, but some of them are. And there have been biosecurity kind of protocols that have been published by the National Tourism Agency and quite a few of the the kind of echo lodges or, or hotels are following those and are actually open. And uh, they recently announced, for example, that anybody who's actually a tourist and has a hotel reservation is allowed to travel um, to, 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 to carry out that activity, even when there are other restrictions that say, you know, you're not allowed to be on the streets if you don't have a certain uh, ID number. <laughs> There's a national curfew. There's a big effort to keep the spread of the of COVID-19, um, you know, as slow as possible here in Honduras. The, the government has done quite a, a great job, I think, of slowing down the spread of the, the pandemic here in Honduras. Okay, great. So, sorry to interject, um, Oliver. So there are a bunch of questions uh, here from the audience, but before, just in case somebody needs to leave, uh, would you be so kind to share your email with, uh, with everybody in the chat so that if, you know, somebody has to leave, they can ask you maybe a question. Sure. Oh, in the chat. Yeah, let me do that right now. Awesome. Thank you. And just so you know, we have uh, people joining. Uh, we have quite an international audience today. We have people from Honduras, from Chile. From, <laughs> we have people from different parts of the U.S. Uh, joining today the presentation. So thank you, everybody, for, for joining. Thank you. And, yeah, and as, as soon as you're done with that, um, we'll, I know we are almost at 8 p.m., but um, if you're okay, we will ask you a couple of the questions that have been posted here, and I think you can see them, but if you want, I can read them to you, so just start oh, from the yeah. back. Yeah. Why, why, don't you, why don't you go ahead and pick the questions and read them out loud? I'll try to read them along, but I'm not sure which one you want. Yeah, so actually one question that came up was um, if you could explain what the most, what is the MOSI project and what does the name mean? And are there, oh, yeah. Res yeah, so if you can comment on that, if there are resident species that are particularly endangered in Honduras. And so if you could start with that. Uh, okay, well, the MOSI project is monitoring of over overwinter survivorship or survival. And typically, MOSI stations are focused on um, the migratory birds that come from the United States, although we've chosen to include all of the resident birds as well in the study, and in fact, carry out the protocol, not just for the winter months, but all through the year. So we're hoping to carry out monthly site visits for two and a half days per month to our research station, which is a uh, pine oak forest and collect data on survivorship of migratory birds and resident birds. Um, the, the MOSI stations are a network of stations that are coordinated by the Institute for Bird Populations, and they're focused on collecting the data for migratory species uh, and doing continent-wide analyses of survivorship. Great, uh, and then the uh, follow-up was about uh, where species are particularly endangered in 
Uh, one of the North American migratory species that is endangered is the golden cheeked warbler, which breeds in the Edwards Plateau area of, of Texas mostly, and then winters in the, the Mesoamerican pine oak forests. Uh, there's also the golden winged warbler, which is a species of special concern in North America that winters all across Honduras. Um, Cerulean warblers migrate through Honduras on their way to the Andes of South America. And then in terms of the resident birds, there, there are some very rare resident endemic species like um, uh, Doricha enicura, what is that? The, I'm having a mind block on the English name of the hummingbird, the Doricha enicura, the slender sheer tail. Slender shear tail is a very rare uh, endemic bird of the, of the pine oak region as well, which we have here in Honduras, but there's not a lot of information about populations. And that's not one, unfortunately, that we'll be able to study at our monitoring site. Um, there are quetzals. That's what, another bird that's considered to be threatened and especially threatened by climate change because they live in the mountaintop forests, like cloud forests, and a lot of these mountaintop forests are drying up, and some of them are going to disappear over the next few decades with climate change. So that's a species of special concern that, that uh, may be suffering in the long term. And of course, if you get down into the jungles, you have species like great green macaws that are endangered, yellow naped parrots, which are endangered uh, Yellow-headed parrots as well get into Honduras in the northeast and the north, the very north of the country and near the Guatemala border. That's endangered. You want to go to the next question? You any? Um, sure. So actually, there were a couple of people that were wondering, like, uh, what accommodations are available for people that want to go, you know, do their watching there, and also kind of combine question if there is some opportunities from, you know, from Minnesota students to go down there, like do surveys and banding. So I guess what kind of opportunities there will be for people here, both tourism-wise and student, you know, research-wise? Okay. Um, well, in terms of tourism, there's, uh, at least when we're not in a pandemic, there are plenty of really wonderful lodges. And um, the lodging is very comfortable and excellent food, excellent services in many places in Honduras. And so one, someone could spend two or three weeks on a birding tour around Honduras, see 500 or 600 species and have a spectacular visit. So you shouldn't worry about not finding adequate lodging. There's plenty of great lodging. And there's a, a range of lodging from expensive to very inexpensive. Um, that, uh, that, so yeah, if you wanna come on a birding trip, you can have a fantastic experience birding around Honduras and uh, have wonderful uh, lodging and attention from, from guides. So I encourage everybody to think about coming, planning your next birding trip to Honduras, why not? Um, now in terms of opportunities for students from Minnesota, I, I guess I have to say, you know, you'd have to find a specific research project that was offering those opportunities and I can't mention one that I know of that right now that is looking for volunteers for several months. Um, but again, if somebody wanted to do a trip like that and wanted to write to me, maybe I would know of something at that time. And I think it's a great idea. I remember when I graduated from high school in Massachusetts, I was dying to do something like that. And I went to Peru and uh, tried to volunteer in Peru on a, on a bird study in the jungle. Unfortunately, when I got there, I, there were no bird studies going on. And so, it, so I, I did some traveling and some bird watching in Peru, and it was great. But um, the best thing now with the communication we have, the best thing is to write ahead as, my, as far ahead as possible and find out what opportunities there are. Wonderful. So I just wanted to make sure that Wilmar uh, finishes up with um, the project, you know, the partnership that, Wilmar, do you want to comment on the the, um, the, the money that we're trying to raise. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Can, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Okay. Sorry. So yes, I mean, the immigration partners, uh, our chapter is, is still, um, you know, asking for donations. We, 
we uh, you know we we want to support the work that uh, that um, you know Dr. Comer and the team there is going to be doing uh, for the entire year. You know we we, we have uh, I think we had a goal uh, of uh, ra finishing up raising about two thousand dollars. I think there was a there was a a uh, contribution, a matching challenge. Somebody had put two thousand dollars, and uh, you know, if we could match, uh, you know, those two thousand dollars, we'll be able to to get that goal of uh, of four thousand dollars. So we're still, you know, uh, uh, trying to get more more donations to to get that matching uh, matching done. And, and these funds are going to support the work that uh, the folks in Honduras are going to be doing, you know, collecting data. They're also going to be working with community members. They're also, you know, going to be working with some of the young folks in the birding clubs. So that will help a lot to promote the kind of research that the ASHU has been doing in the country. Maybe I can just mention, uh, Wilmer, that the funds that, minute, that your chapter is raising and sending down is being is going to be used specifically to cover the travel expenses for members of the Asho Birding Clubs to come and participate in the bird banding and learn about bird banding from professional biologists. So it's a real kind of environmental education opportunity um, to for 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 young people, especially maybe some older people too. Uh, but but Asho members who don't know about how bird banding works and they want to come and participate in the bird banding operations. So that's how we're going to use the funds. Yep. Yeah, great. No, uh, I think uh, we're about here, uh, almost 10 minutes after the hour. So uh, thank you very much. Oliver, I know that you're very busy with classes there. Uh, you're busy with preparing for the running of the Mosi station starting in November. Uh, and I mean, uh, thank you for taking the time to, to talk to us. I think it's very important. Again, you know, we, we don't hear a lot in, in, in this part of the world about the work that folks are doing there. And, and I think it's very important for people to realize that there, is, there are good things happening and there is a lot of, uh, a lot of opportunities to support that work. So uh, thank you very much for taking the time and, and join us. Well, thank yeah. you very much for the invitation. I really appreciate it. I usually give my talks in Spanish, so it's, it's interesting. It's fun to give a talk in English for one. <laughs> I teach in Spanish. I have 320 students in an ecology class right now where my students and where they, they're doing an, an interesting project of reporting uh, wildlife to iNaturalist. And so that's their big project right now. Uh, okay. Great though to see these, these kids who have never really looked at wildlife go out and start taking pictures of things and reporting them and learning about identification because I think that's so important to get more and more people involved in wildlife identification so that they can become people who appreciate wildlife and then get involved in wildlife conservation. Yeah, yeah. thank you so much, Oliver. I concur with the comments. And I just, before everybody leaves, um, for those that are hanging around, I just wanted to share just uh, our next meetings. Let me just share my screen really quick. Our next meeting for the, for the chapter. So we have several committees in the chapter and uh, we, are, we have a community engagement committee coming up uh, the 18th of October. And we will be doing all of these meetings by Zoom. And then we have an advocacy committee on Wednesday, the 21st, and our next board meeting will be the 26th of October. So this is also the website for the chapter and all of that information is there as well. And we have an exciting program also coming up in December and you can also find more information about it on the website and also I have to register for it uh, over there. And finally, just to wrap up, so our own leader, Keith, was part of this, uh, of this program, Talking Volumes. So the author of this book, Best Per Flights, Helen McDonald, was interviewed last week by NPR, by Kerry Miller. And in this link, you can find the video to the, to the interview. And after the interview with her, actually Keith um, answered questions about birding and conservation. So, uh, you can also find information about it on the website or in this link as well. 
So I think that was um, the final announcements, just in case people were leaving or something. So thank you again, Oliver. And Keith, I don't know if you want to say anything else, but otherwise, um, really, gracias. <laughs> it was amazing. Simply remember to vote. <laughs> mm -hmm.